You have gathered this evening for a rather intriguing subject, and one which, 50 years ago, no one really had talked about. You had to live 500 years ago or today to be able to examine this particular theme, because it is a highly controversial and comparatively incredible subject. The corpus of Paracelsus, or the great body of his work, is made up of many different sections, some of them uh, dealing with phases of me medicine or alchemy, and others with peculiar doctrines which he accumulated in these wanderings which we described last week. We know that there was no man in the history of learning who had so broad a sympathy for unfavored beliefs. He went out and he talked with people. He visited small villages and communities. Went out into deserted areas where hermits and recluses dwelt. And here he learned the lore of his world, the fables, the legends, the stories. And perhaps he was nearly 500 years before his time, because it dawned on him, even as early as the 15th and rather the 16th century, that all these beliefs of man had to have some valid origin. They meant something. We're beginning to come back to this in analytical psychology. We no longer regard ancient symbols as mere inventions, fabrications, or delusions. We know that they tie into some phase of human consciousness. He knew this intuitively although he had no scientific background upon which to support his theory. He learned, among other things, for example, that all over the world, people of every race, every class, every degree of intelligence, have long honored and affirmed the reality of beings other than those with which we are commonly acquainted. The Persian has his theory. The Mongol is Zen. The Japanese, the Chinese, the Hindus have their mysterious, familiar spirits. The Greeks have their nymphs and dryades. The ancient Druids have their gnomes. The German legends of the Nibelungen people. All of these stories in three Paracelsus. He said that it must mean something. The whole world for thousands of years could not have accepted these stories had they been pure fabrications. And we remember, of course, in one of the Socratic dialogues, where Socrates, having chosen a pleasant place beside a grove of trees in the country, uh, declared that it would be a fine occasion for a discourse because the familiar spirit would be there to guide and lead him. Now, he was not exactly a fool. He believed definitely in a daemon or spirit that directed his own life. <coughs> we also know that the Egyptians, particularly Iamblichus and his mysteries of the Chaldeans and Egyptians, described familiar spirits. And in this work, we have the first statement, perhaps, the concept of the guardian angel. The guardian angel returns to us in Christian theology. And even up to the present time, while belief in this guardian angel is not a doctrine of the church, it is considered as of the mind of the church. Therefore, it may be believed without interfering with orthodoxy. That such beings have long been held to exist, have always been accepted, became of sufficient interest to Paracelsus, he began to examine it as a theory, 
to find out if possible the philosophical reasoning behind it and the theological and scientific justifications for such belief. His findings in his own time were naturally rejected. They've been rejected for centuries since. In the last 25 years, our world has changed, and many things long rejected are now considered with some thought, and many things generally accepted are now being questioned. So with this preamble, we will try to set the stage for the Paracelsian concept, and bear in mind that it is susceptible of more than one interpretation. We probably cannot exhaust the interpretations in the time that we have, but perhaps they will suggest further thinking of your own. You know, as we've said before, that Paracelsus was essentially a devout man, that he believed strongly in religion and had actually memorized the Bible so that he could quote any part of it upon request. Though he was not a stranger to the scriptures, nor to the miracles and mysterious occurrences which they describe and examine also. And he came to this conclusion, and this is one of the premises from the Archodoxus, which is the beginning of his study of this subject. He said, I affirm or believe that there are two kinds of substances in nature, two kinds of bodies, and as he expresses it rather quaintly, there is a flesh from Adam. And there is also a flesh that is not from Adam. Now he explains as he goes on that by flesh from Adam, as he recalls considerably upon early Kabbalistic speculation, there is a kind of flesh that men know which is composed of a mingling of the four basic elements that were known to the ancients. Now, we must bear in mind that the elemental theory, as we have it today, the theory of elements, uh, does not quite coincide with the older concept. So when we use elements today to think of nitrogen and uh, uh, uranium and helium and all these things, we are not thinking in the terms of his day. The ancients recognized essentially four elements. These four elements are the familiar ones that we all refer to, earth, water, fire, and air. Now, according to Paracelsus, flesh or bodies coming from Adam or descending in the human way are all composed of compounds of these four elements. Therefore, in the human body, there is a physical or mineral part a vegetable, or we might say humid part. There is a fiery principle of heat, warmth, which we recognize in the body, and there is an airy or gaseous principle. The human body, then, is made up of solids, liquids, gases, and a fiery principle. These were the elements known to the ancients. This does not mean that they did not recognize gold and silver and iron and all these things, but they gave them a different classification. Elements to them were always these four, and they returned to us in many forms of symbolism. Uh, the four rivers that flow out of the Garden of Eden, for example, uh, were said originally to represent the streams of energy flowing through the primordial elements. These elements were represented gradually by the symbols of the six signs of the zodiac. Taurus the bull representing earth, Leo the lion representing fire, Scorpio the scorpion representing water, and Aquarius or the water bearer, whose water, however, is an electrical fluid was the ancient symbol of air. These elements then later became associated with the corners of the world and even with the four apostles or evangelists of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like the Lion of St. Mark, the Eagle of St. John, and so on. All 
bodies, according to these ancient beliefs, were composed of four elements in a compound. By means of this compound, man, descending from Adam, lived in four elementary spheres at the same time. He had dominion over these elements and was able to control, integrate, and order them because he possessed a fifth element within himself. This fifth element has descended to us in a term that we occasionally use as a symbol of something exceptionally valuable or exceptionally pure. We call it quint essence or the fifth essence. Now the quintessentia of alchemy was a fifth principle called by Paracelsus Azoth. And it was a kind of pure vitality by means of which all elements were held together. This vitality, this quintessence, was that which bound or united elements, forming what were called binders. And this quintessence was the vehicle in man of a principle, a fifth power, which both the Pythagoreans and later the Paracelsians called the soul. Therefore, the quintessence was the symbol of the soul, which was a kind of fifth element, superior to the others, permeating the others, governing the others, and holding them in the compound which we call body. So Paracelsus says that man coming from Adam as a body composed of these elements to which is added as a controlling and directing power the quintessence of the soul. Now Paracelsus goes on to point out that we know these elements only through their phenomenal manifestations in our objective world. We know that Earth extends beneath our feet, and that whenever we touch any solid object, we are touching some form of physical matter. The from Earth grows bodies, the most corporeal parts of these bodies being themselves of the Earth earthy, like the trunk of a tree or the bones and flesh of an animal. These things belong to the physical element. They are derived from it and ultimately they will return to it again. And from these physical factors, a part of man's nature is derived. A second level contributing to him is liquid. And in the case of the human body, we know that it is mostly liquid. Therefore, that the so-called fluidic or to symbolist water element is extremely important to man. He can live much longer without food than he can without water. And without the proper amount of fluid in his system, he rapidly loses his life. So water is essential to his survival. Yet this water which preserves him can also drown him if he should fall into an ocean or a lake. So water is essential, but it is also extremely dangerous. The third thing which he must possess in order to be alive is the principle of heat. And the Paracelsians established the existence of this heat radiating area in the liver. And they held that heat uh, made possible the circulation and distribution of the energies of the body. It helps to maintain and regulate it. And that nearly all the channels and instruments of the body has to do with the distribution of heat, and that heat to man is essential to life. Without heat, he can also die. With too much heat, he can be consumed. So fire is, again, a benevolent but dangerous element. The final element is air. A man is dependent upon it even more than he realizes. He knows that it is necessary to respiration, but he does not recognize how complete his indebtedness is and so perhaps he uh, traveled in too rarefied an altitude or something of that nature, when he discovers furthermore that the pressure of air upon him is important to the organization and maintenance of his body. So air becomes a very important thing. 
And these four together are elements recognized by the ancients. Paracelsus said, that is true, but man, forever the utilitarian, forever thinking of everything only in terms of a, a visible and apparent circumstance, has never given proper thought or consideration to these substances uh, which are within him and around him, which form a natural environment and atmosphere, and in which he lives. First of all, he must realize that these elements are not simply things heaped together, aggregates of confusion. Each of these elements has its boundaries. It has its laws and its rules. It has its particular channels of expression. And each sustains or supports because of the presence within it of an energy factor. So that these elements are indeed rivers of life. And that when they are cut off from man, man perishes. And yet each of these elements has within it energy so peculiar to itself that man, in order to maintain his physical economy, must maintain the balance of these elements in his body at all times. And any serious imbalance of these elemental polarities will result in sickness or perhaps ultimately the dissolution of the body itself. Now, Paracelsus points out that these elements can conceivably be much more than they seem to be. Fire, for example, we as we know it, is a spontaneous thing, arising here, disappearing there, blazing forth from the volcano or the match that has just been struck. Fire disappears again. Yet the principle of fire remains and may be re-engendered whenever the circumstances appropriate to its appearance are reanimated. According to Paracelsus, therefore, these elements, in more than being simply uh, elements in the constitution of man, are in actuality worlds. The elements of air of which we can not see any tangible part, but which we can sense mostly through the sense of feeling, or the element of water or fire or earth. These elements are not only something we use, something that appears in this world. These elements are complete existences in themselves. The element of water, for example, it's not merely one kind of water. It is essentially a principle, a fluidic medium. And water, as we see it, is only a very small part of its manifestation. The rest of its substance is invisible to us. The same is true even of earth. Only certain forms of earth can we see. Only certain forms of fire can we see. Only certain kinds of air can we recognize or respond to with any of the perceptions or sensitivities that we possess. So Ferris also tells us that what we call the spheres of the four elements are complete worlds in themselves. That these worlds have laws, rules, regulations, that the energies moving in them are susceptible of scientific analysis, but that this analysis is extremely difficult because we are able to know only the consequences of certain manifestations. He uses again the correspondence to man himself. Man, functioning through a body composed of four elements, <coughs> is visible to us. We can touch him, we can listen to him speak, we can uh, make a photographic reproduction of his appearance. But what do we know about him? What do any of these things actually tell us? Man is actually a being, unknown, and as far as we are able objectively to consider him, comparatively unknowable. We recognize only certain of his manifestations. 
we can estimate only those parts of him which are within the sensory gamut which we possess. Now, according to Paracelsus, the same is true of the elements. We have certain knowledge of the elements in their relation to our corporeal existences, but of the elements themselves, their substances and their laws, we know nothing, because all elements, including earth, all elements are essentially invisible, and the visible parts of them are merely extensions into the compounds which we call form. Thus, air has a total existence apart from the air that we breathe. Fire, water, earth have total existences. And the reason we do not appreciate these or understand them better is because they are beyond our dimensional acceptance. So Pettus also brings up the problem of dimension. He says we live in a world of three dimensions. What we do not realize is that we live in a world of infinite dimensions but that man as a creature is bound by three. Therefore his experience is within these three, and when his activity reaches the circumference of these dimensions, it turns back upon him again. He cannot immediately break through into any other dimension. Thus he lives a comparatively limited creature, living in three dimensions and surrounded by perhaps countless dimensions. Now, a dimension is more than an area. A dimension is a kind of differentiation. A dimension implies within itself extent and expanse. Greater dimensions will not be lesser than those that we know. Therefore, the world around us unfolds into dimensions. And of these dimensions, the elements give us some understanding, because these elements expand into dimensions beyond us. And because they so expand, and we are unable to follow them, we regard ourselves as surrounded by space. Space is actually the reservoir of dimensions, and within it are inconceivable differentiations in terms of time, place, number, form, and these essential principles. There are forms that are not three-dimensional, or two-dimensional, or one-dimensional, as we know dimensions. There are energies which cannot be captured within the dimensional pattern of our consciousness or experience. We begin to realize this, for we know that at this moment, this room is filled with energy. And some of these man directed as television or radio, and that these waves are moving around us and perhaps through us constantly, yet we are unaware of them. Yet as they move through us, they are not merely motion. They are not merely a diffusion of vitality. They are patterns ordered, having integration on a level beyond our comprehension. Therefore, they may travel vast distances and be reinterpreted into sound or picture if the appropriate mechanism is available. Paracelsus, therefore, postulates another point. He says, man potentially possesses the mechanism necessary for a further extension of his own consciousness into a polydimensional universe. That the, these things must happen in the course of time. And that when they do happen, man is going to be gravely surprised. He is going to realize that the space around him, the interval for factors which he recognizes, has no existence except in terms of his own sensory limitations. And that what he calls emptiness is merely a fullness beyond his comprehension. That nowhere in the universe is there actually a vacuum. And that the nearest thing to a vacuum, according to Paracelsus, is the head of a sophisticated 
human being who having uh, lost his mind against the free distribution of energy uh, soon entered the state of comparative vacuity. The next point then in connection with our problem is to follow the Peristaltian concept, for that is what we are dedicated to doing this evening, into these worlds, worlds of elemental substances, worlds that, according to him, human beings have occasionally been able to contact. Paracelsus was convinced, and he expresses it in his own terms, that man, at least certain human beings, on a king, are able to break through some of these dimension binders with which we are so familiar. Usually, such occurrences happen in sleep or in a so-called dream state, a state in which objective faculties are temporarily suspended. Paracelsus joins most philosophers in recognizing that our comparative ignorance of the subjective is due to our hypnotic addiction to the objective. But because we have directed and trained our faculties only in one direction, that they are not available for the full area which they might be able to cover as they receive adequate instruction. He also points out that certain experiences, difficult to understand and, in, and interpret, are not so rare with children. But the small child seemingly retains a certain capacity to penetrate dimensions as we know them. He also observes that this same proclivity is a mark in primitive people, that you are very primitive human being who lives very close to life and to nature, and who has been comparatively unconditioned by the sophistications of intellectualism, that these kind of persons also have a rapport to nature around them. These are the ones who nearly always insist and affirm the reality of the submundane beings or the creatures existing within the elements. Paracelsus tells us that if we could conceive, for example, of water as a vast world of humidity, a world extending like our physical earth and expanding beyond it into the atmosphere outside, a vast world of fluid motion, a world in which the humid principle is the solitary element. Aristotle makes a very great point of the fact that the elements represent fields in which are unfolding forms of life that are not composite. But the difference between elementary beings and human beings lies in the fact that the elementary being is not composed of a compound of four elements, nor even of two, but is a creature subsisting and existing only in its own elements, having no nature, no integration, no compound or composite nature outside of this single element. Thus, so to say, in this humid element, which we call visibly water, and which perhaps the Greeks best liken to humidity, there would be a great world of humid life. This world would have its own flora and fauna. It would not be merely a diffusion in the atmosphere. This world could have in it a kind of equivalent to everything that we have with the exception that everything there is composed of this one elemental substance. Thus there could be rocks, but they would be composed of humidity. There could be plants growing, but the plant, its body, and its substance are all the same thing. There could be animals, 
animals composed of the humid principle alone. And there could also be creatures resembling human beings, but composed of one substance only, and not composed of a compound as man is. Sotosaurus declares that from the learned doctors of Constantinople and other places, that he had gained much knowledge concerning these kinds of beings, and that the primary purpose of them, for everything in nature must have a purpose, is that elements serve two functions. First of all, uh, they are spheres or planes or fields of growth. And a great world, whether it be a world of fire or the visible world of man, a great diffusion of environmental dimensions cannot remain uninhabited. But it is inconceivable that any abode suitable to life should not have life. But that the nature of these elements is such that this life is of one element and one element only. Therefore, Paracelsus says, referring to elemental beings, that they differ from every other type of creature that man can know. Everything visible to him. They differ from animals because in many respects they are superior to animals. They differ from man in one primary respect, namely that they have no soul, because they are not ensouled creatures. Man is a being composed of spirit, soul, and body. Elementaries, according to Paracelsus, consist of only one body, one substance. Their soul, their body, their life, all these elements are undifferentiated, are one substance. This means that a creature so constituted and possessing, as the elemental does, according to Paracelsus, intellect, that such creatures, as he expresses it, are amoral. That is, they have no moral sense. They are neither good nor bad. In this they resemble animals. They do not worship, nor do they fear. They do not fear death, nor do they hope immortality. They have an existence without conflict. And because there is no relationship between elements in their constitution, there is no wear or tear as we know it. There is no rapid exhaustion of energy as there is with man. Therefore, these elementary beings exist for a very long time in comparison to man, and when the time of their existence ends, they dissolve again into the substances from which they came. Because all elements are essentially material, though not physical, these beings are essentially material, but not physical, as we see it. Therefore, they are subject to laws of generation. They are subject to practically every pattern that we know. And they represent a gradual evolution within elemental fields. And Paracelsus opines that perhaps it is in this way and in this kind of greenhouse of the gods that the first sproutings begin which ultimately result in compound beings. And therefore that the elements are gradually individualizing, and that sometime out of these elements will be created beings that have compound existence, but that in this period they do not so uh, exist. Paracelsus, following the ancient concepts from Greece, Egypt, India, China, and many other areas, divides, therefore, these elemental beings into four groups of which he considers the earth spirit, or the gnomes, to be those most closely associated with matter. The water spirit he calls undines, or nymphs. The fire spirit he calls salamanders. And the air spirit he calls silks. These are more or less the traditional names. You'll find them in the Irish folklore. And it is a poor Irishman indeed who has lived his whole life 
close to the clod, who has not at least had one personal experience with a leprechaun. Such a thing would be inconceivable. I remember one fiery bearded Irishman whom I knew years ago who was able to tell you the whole history of Ireland long before human beings were invented because he knew Ireland's history back in the time when only the little people inhabited the land and were finally driven into the bogs and fens by the coming of that cruel and degenerate group of individuals we call humans. But this old gentleman not only knew all the lore, but when you flatly said to him, but have you ever seen them? He gives you a look of pained indignation. Of course he has. They're his old friends. Every good Irishman has seen them. Well, we can say maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But certainly the law was there, and it always been there. The law which Paracelsus declared had to mean something, and he was determined to find out if possible what it did mean. So we have four kinds of elemental beings living within their own world. And Paracelsus went so far as to point out that under various rules and circumstances, the elemental not only fulfill the universal pattern of law as evolving life still in a, an undifferentiated state, but that they become and are the natural administrators of the elemental procedures. Therefore, that all of the mysterious activities which we associate with the elements are due to these guiding powers within them. What he is trying to tell us, essentially, is that each element is governed by an intellective core, and that it is perfectly possible for air and water and earth and fire to fulfill certain rational activities. Perhaps not because the element in itself is rational, but because it is administered by rational beings within itself. Therefore, that the various processes in nature, particularly those processes which we call natural, the natural processes we see around us, some apparently obvious, some extremely mysterious, are due to these elemental beings, that they are the ones were constantly guarding and directing the motion of elements in even the material compounds and patterns which we see. He held furthermore that these beings and others, for he goes much further in his studies of this, and others, some composite, some simple creatures like the elementals, constitute the population of an invisible world, moving in upon man. And Paracelsus was convinced that someday this invisible world would move in closer, and that man would discover that it would not be necessary for him to find other planets in order to discover other beings, that he would discover them here, and that these other beings uh, would come to our awareness in various ways. One of the ways being, of course, the thing we least recognize, namely our own growth. Man, regardless of the limitations and restrictions which he imposes upon the development of his own structure, is evolving. He is constantly becoming a more sensitive creature. He is releasing bands of extrasensory perception slowly but inevitably. As these bands increase, he will not be of the opinion that he has done anything. He will be of the opinion that the other phase of life is moving in upon him. He will not realize that it was always there. He will discover it. And when he discovers it, it will be new. And he may affirm that it is the result of this other life pressing upon him. Actually, it is the gradual unfoldment of his own sensitivity. Just as, for example, we can say that a law, such as the law of gravity, uh, if we are still willing to accept it, 
If it is true, it was always there, whether man discovered it or not. If this other world around man is real, it is always here, whether we know it or not. When we become aware of it, we consider it something new and remarkable, but the newness is only in ourselves, because we have discovered it. Now we pause for a moment now and uh, take up another phase of the Paracelsian psychology relating to these things, and then gradually we'll try to draw some of the points together. But he also differentiated an entirely different group of beings from elementals. And uh, for his purposes, specifically, he referred to these other beings as elementary. Now, elementaries and elementals are usually considered synonymous terms, and we've even used them that way ourselves. But for the specific study of the Paracelsian concept, we must at this time pause and distinguish. An elemental is a creature such as we have described one of the four orders of nature spirit, or the type of being which we find among the religious beliefs of the Navajo and Hopi Indians with their Kachina, and uh, with all the little people of the Irish and all these things. The elementary, according to Paracelsus, is an artificial creature created in the invisible world by man himself. Now this presents us with a new psychological problem. According to Paracelsus, the most common form of the elementary is the incubus. Now, an incubus is a kind of demon. It is a demon which originates not in any demoniacal or infernal principle in nature. An incubus is an expression of a phase of man's divinity. Because, it says Paracelsus, when God created Adam, he bestowed upon Adam not only a body, but breathed into him the life of God himself. And this life includes the power to create. Therefore, man is a creator. He is a creator not only in terms of body, in the perpetuation of species. He is a creator, as we know, in terms of imagination, where he creates art. He is a creator in levels of science, in levels of philosophy. He is a creator of architecture. Man is forever a creator, finding expression through creative activity. But his creative powers are not only external, but also internal. And Paracelsus pointed out that within man is a continual power, a lodestone, from which things can be and are perpetually being born. And that having been born, these things have a strange kind of life derived from man playing God. And that wherever the human being exercises any impulse or any instinct, he sets vibration in action. And vibration means the creation or engendering of life. Man is therefore, whether he realizes it or not, capable of creating beings. Not only by intent, but without intent. And that man out of his emotions and his thoughts, is also uh, perpetuating a kind of progeny. And that thought form, or emotion form, emanating from the human being, are living things. Having a life derived from man, having a dependency upon man, and uh, surviving only in the degree or to the term that man makes this survival possible. An example uh, derived from the Paracelsian thinking uh, may clarify this a little more. For instance, the human being has the power of speech. 
the ancients fully realized that the human power to create sound was closely associated with the mystery of the created fiat, or the word. In the beginning was the word. Man is continually creating <coughs> words. And the human lamic is actually the womb of sound. And just as surely as man may bear flesh of his flesh from his body, so he may bear life from his Every word that man creates and speaks is a rate of vibration. And we have not yet learned how any rate of vibration dies. This rate of vibration, this word that is spoken, goes out and like the rippling caused by a rock falling in a still pool, these ripples go on and on and on until they disappear from our awareness. But we have no proof that any energy is actually destructible. Thus, well, sound is a kind of light. Uh, in the Orient, uh, certain uh, addicts to hashish and other drugs have reported the ability to see words coming out of the human mouth and that these words appear as luminous forms or patterns. Paracelsus would say that is undoubtedly quite probable, because man is forever creating. And in the invisible world around him, he is creating constantly through thought and emotion activity. Thoughts are things, says an ancient adage. And here Paracelsus would also agree that thought gradually creates entities. That these entities, supplied and sustained by the flowing motion of thought, strengthen, become more and more uh, densified, not visible to our sight, but capable of exercising an ever greater influence upon our objective life through the subjective. Just as man's energy move from the invisible into visible and corporeal function, so these thought and emotion entities, or elementary, move into manifestation through the functions and processes of the body. Paracelsus, gathering ancient lore, gives us a certain amount of information, for instance, on the idea of the incubus. And uh, it is rather uh, interesting from a psychological standpoint because it may explain something <coughs> that psychologists are not yet able to fully understand. We know that the human psyche becomes ridden with pressure centers, which we call fixations, complexes, phobias, and the like. We know that the continual repetition of ideas, the maintenance of a certain attitude, particularly a destructive one, and your incubus is a destructive elementary, that this continual process gradually causes a fixation to intensify, to, so to say, crystallize to have ever clearer and more distinct boundaries, and to become ever more avaricious in itself in relation to its effect upon the person who is dominated by it. Paracelsus suggests that the analogy between uh, the incubus and the parasite on a plant. Just as a beautiful orchid lives partly at least upon the tree and partly upon the air, and as the mistletoe and other of these uh, parasitic plants and uh, other parasites in nature live by taking the life of the tree or plant to which they are attached, so your incubus becomes a man-made parasite, gradually taking the life and vitality of the person, living upon it until it destroys it. 
we can we can see something in this philosophy which probably Paracelsus could never have seen. He observes today the tremendous increase in mental pathology. We observe how attitudes becoming more and more fixed become what science terms obsessional. Paracelsus used the term obsession to, to signify possession by an entity. Today, psychologically, we use obsession to signify possession by an abnormal attitude. Now, where is the fact of this fact? Is the abnormal attitude actually an entity? We don't know. We can't say that it is not. We prefer to assume that it is not. But how can we completely explain uh, the peculiar undermining of the consciousness of a human being? who under the pressure of an abnormal attitude of his own, gradually is devoured by this attitude, which appears to be more and more possessive, and when under treatment becomes highly defensive. One interesting point that we have in the problem of psychotherapy is a condition which is susceptible of more than one interpretation. We take that for granted. But it will seem that an abnormal situation under treatment will fight to continue itself. In other words, it will resist in every way possible the therapy which is directed against it. And wherever we reach a certain degree in the development of a nail the tendency of the patient, that is a mental ailment, is gradually to come to the defense of the ailment instead of the recovery and become finally completely a slave, defending abnormalcy as he would never defend normalcy. We therefore see people who are suffering from serious complexes fighting desperately to preserve the complex instead of getting over it refusing to seek treatment, clinging to it as though it was becoming the most valued possession that they have. Now, is it, how, how are we going to explain this? How are we going to explain an area of mental phenomena? How are we going to say that an attitude which for all we know, or what we believe, can merely be itself a product of mechanistic function, how can we prove that this attitude has boundaries, that it grows, that it is nourished, that it enlarges, increases, and preserves boundaries of its own, slowly emerging as some kind of an essential invisible structure within the mental field. What this structure may be, we do not know. But that it is some kind of a strange cellular-like structure, we are convinced. Because we know that as we approach it, it becomes agitated. That when we depart from it, it subsides. That under various aggravations and exaggerations, it releases itself powerfully. Under certain other conditions, it does not. We know that it grows. We know that a small bad habit can ultimately become a large bad habit. Why is this is merely space out here in which thought is moving? Is not one thought dissipated, then another, and then another? Why are they accumulated? Unless in some way there is a structural pattern by which this accumulation is reasonable. Why do two thoughts of a kind build together to make a bigger one? There has to be some kind of a mental chemistry operating. And Paracelsus says this mental chemistry is simply due to the fact that these creatures fashioned and maintained by the energy of man become kinds of living beings. That these living beings are vampires. 
And that what we call a vampire is not the bat coming down the chimney in some ancient legend, but man himself creating monstrosities in his own psychic life which vampirize his faculties and disappear therewith. Now, Paracelsus went still further in his thinking, and he went so far as to declare that these vampire things, these uh, incubi that man creates, have the same tendency as nearly all other unformed or unformal creatures namely to drift into manifestation, to come into expression, to become embodied. And he was of the opinion that what we call disease is very largely due uh, to this field of subjective psychic malfunction, which we would call wrong thinking and wrong emotion. He did not go to the uh, extent of taking the attitude that uh, everything is just the way we think it is. But he did hold the belief that attitudes, mental and emotional, which reach the condition of intensification, that they create a psychic organism, that these psychic organisms then turn back upon man, creating certain physical symptomology and that many so-called ravaging diseases are actually emotion and thought forms attaching themselves to the body and vampirizing it. He did not, however, take the attitude that these entities uh, were bona fide beings, like demons, or that they were some nasty relative working on us subjectively. He was much more inclined to feel that what we term the black magician is simply the black psychic side of ourselves. That each individual creates this black magician, which is actually and factually a false emotion entity built out of his own selfishness. And that where a person living apparently a respectable life, but inwardly filled with hate, and destructive attitude, that this person is creating another being, and that this other being is becoming his familiar or his spirit, just like uh, Mephisto attached himself to Faust, and that this being created by ourselves is our own uncontrolled, negative, animistic self and that it will proceed to turn upon us like an outraged spirit and destroy it, unless we previously destroy it. So Paracelsus fills the mental and emotional atmosphere of life with these creatures uh, which man himself fashions. And in his problem of therapy, therefore, we'll come down for a moment, to Paracelsus again as a scientist. We have uh, touched on him a bit as a philosopher, and no one will question that his doctrine of elementals goes into the rarefied atmospheres of theology. But uh, we'll come down for a moment to the scientific problem. Having created a concept, Paracelsus went to work to try to prove whether or not it was thought forms or emotion forms was with vibration, that they themselves represented a kind of vibration, that they could only be reached by a vibration, that as vibration sustained them in the form of the neurotic emotion of the owner, so antipathetical vibrations could destroy them. So he entered into a strange world of invisible warfare between vibratory forces, and his only guide for a long time was his study of planetary motion. Later he added to that a considerable knowledge of magnets, of lodestones, and particularly of the early, not the present form, but the early element which was known as electrons. He caused 
rings and other devices to be composed of various elements. And on some cases, he was able, he felt, to draw poisons out of the individual. He also believed that the uh, thought forms and emotion forms that had attached themselves to persons as parasites could be transferred. That there was a possibility of a psychic surgery for their removal. If, however, they were simply bombarded, as soon as the bombardment was over, these forms would return, even though battered and shaken, and continue to derive whatever life they could from the previous owner. But Paracelsus discovered that these parasites, by what he called sympathetic medicine, could be transplanted to creatures that they did not hurt, and that thought and emotion forms destructive to man, for example, were harmless to vegetation. This was a rather complicated procedure, and in one of the other discussions on sympathetic therapies, we will go into it. But his, a very large part of his medicine, as he himself tells us, his medical practice, was his effort to do the one thing which he felt to be most necessary, namely, to treat, in some way, the invisible part of man. In other words, your visible part, by the time the ailment got there, you were just on the border of being too late. The trouble was not only well underway, but due to the natural thoughtlessness and indifference of people, uh, they did not even approach uh, the physician uh, when symptoms first appeared. They usually waited much too long. By the time Paracelsus or any other physician inherited the patient, the ailment was in an advanced stage. Paracelsus, looking over such incurable ailments as diabetes, that is in his day, tuberculosis, uh, arthritis, and things of that nature, was convinced that the true therapy for them would have to be found in treating their cause, and that their cause was not uh, purely physical. Certainly it could be aggravated by physical circumstances. And Paracelsus was very conscious of hygiene, diet, and the use of mineral baths, and things of that nature. But he was convinced primarily that most ailments of the human body arose in the invisible network of factors behind the personality itself, behind the corporeal structure. He did not believe that the elementals, as nature spirits, had too much to do with this. He did not believe them to be more than mischievous, perhaps spiteful, certainly not essentially malicious. But he also declared that these beings would fight when their elements were disturbed. Thus, an individual who, through his activities or functions, disturbed the liquid distribution in his body, or disturbed uh, the uh, physical elements, or the airy principle, or the fiery principle, when he misused these, or disturbed their harmony, or failed to maintain their law and order, then the elementals came into the picture in the effort to defend and reorganize and restore their own elements, whatever these elements might be. On the other hand, the elementaries, or the man-created creatures, had only one essential motive, and that was the motive of the emotion that created them. If hate created them, they hated completely but they were bound only to the person whose hate had created them. Contrary to his general opinion on the subject, Paracelsus did not believe that you could hate someone and that this elementary you created would then go out and hurt the person you hate. He did not believe that at all because he declared that this elementary could not exist except in the direct presence of your own energy field. Therefore, it could never leave you and the hate which you had bestowed upon it could only return to you. Paracelsus believed that hate 
for example, having projected itself as a vibratory rate from the human being, been captured in some form of a complex entity, in the form of a fixation or neurosis or whatever we want to call it, but captured in the form of an entity, that this entity <coughs> gradually strengthened and continued to grow upon that hate. And whenever that person hated again, that was food for this thing. And every exhibition of hate, every impulse, every instinct, every emotion or feeling of hatred that the person allowed to rise within himself immediately became a nourishment to this entity. This entity then began to radiate its own force. And this force turned back upon the person as a form of chemical hate and began to destroy the harmony and equilibrium of the various functions of the body. Uh, Paracelsus had another theory which perhaps would seem very ridiculous to us and yet we have never solved it satisfactorily even to the present time. Namely, that what we call the germ is a man-made living thing. That bacterial organisms, viruses, and all these other mysterious microforms of life that are so minute that we can hardly distinguish them, that these are created by man. And he declares, or declares, that epidemical disease would always parallel or follow epidemical outbreaks of human intensity. That war, for example, would nearly always end in a plague. Not necessarily would this plague be limited to the stricken area, but that an entire group of energy units projected by human consciousness in the form of evil would become microorganisms and would turn back upon man himself, that by polluting the psychic field of his world, he destroyed his own power to live, and that mankind, therefore, was constantly suffering from what we would term smog. In this case, not the physical kind, which is probably due to uncontrollable avarice on the part of certain individuals who will not uh, make proper arrangements to protect the air for their fellow creatures, but that there is a psychic smog, and that this is due to the tremendous discharge of negative emotional mental units of energy, and that these units of energy infecting space create a common toxin. These energies do not necessarily uh, transmit themselves to anyone. In other words, these collective hates do not cause the individual to hate, necessarily, who does not normally have the inclination. Nor does this ailment necessarily fall upon the individual as a, in, the, in the nature of active entity obsession. It falls upon him principally in toxic quality. The hate which is not his own affects him toxically. It is not uh, necessarily uh, going to attach itself to him as an entity, but it does corrupt the substances from which his nutrition is derived. And wherever the psychic field of humanity collectively is disturbed, you will have a further expression of poor health disease, sickness, and things of that nature. Paracelsus believes, therefore, that the ultimate end of the problem of health lay in the same manner as the solution of other primaries, namely that only the wise and the good and the happy person can be well, that there is no other answer, and that sickness in the individual is due to some imbalance in himself. Now, Paracelsus himself was sick, and so is everyone else. 
He knew this. He realized that under the conditions in which human beings live, complete freedom from sickness is almost impossible. Uh, the uh, conditions arising in society, the collective attitudes of mankind, we cannot completely resist, nor can we protect ourselves against every subterfuge against our health which is practiced around us. But Paracelsus believed we could greatly minimize our vulnerability through the reintegration of our own natures, and that what we might term the Defensive vitality uh, is derived from the fact that our own psychic nature is free from elementaries, free from parasitical attitudes which are constantly draining our vital resources. Now, in the early editions of his works and some others, we have man's negative emotion, mental life, represented surrounding him as a cloud of devil-like insects. He is moving in a cloud filled with the most horrible little monsters. These represent his own attitudes, which become poisonous to him, and from which he cannot escape. There is no remedy because he can go anywhere, he can be with anyone, he can have much or little Yet his mental emotional habits can still pursue him unless he changes them. He can never escape from their consequences. Paracelsus, therefore, was a sort of minister of goodwill among men. He believed definitely in the importance of man establishing a relationship of goodwill to the intelligent universe around him. That only when man was thoughtful of the world would the world protect him. That only when he himself uh, labored for the common good would the common good labor for him. That a partnership had to be set up between man and nature and between visible and invisible in the compound constitution of the human being. That if he had certain attitudes strong within himself, the elementals might reveal to him the treasures of the earth, and the elementary certainly would not bother him. If, however, they had already come into existence, and he was beginning to feel the various deprivations of energy which result from thought and emotion forms draining vitality, then it was up to him to take the necessary steps uh, to cut off or to remove uh, these uh, malicious factors. He pointed out that everything survives only on nutrition suitable to itself. That nothing can survive on a nutrition which is unsuitable. Evil cannot survive on good. Happiness cannot survive if fed misery continuously. Misery, on the other hand, cannot continue if it is fed happiness. All fixation and complexes, or elementaries as he called them, in order to survive, grow, and become strong and powerful, must be continually nourished. Therefore, the first remedial process that man can employ is to stop nourishing those conditions which are destroying him. He knows what they are because he knows basically whether his attitudes are constructive or destructive. Unless he is subnormal mentally, he is certainly aware when he is kind or unkind. He is aware when he is suspicious or trusting, when he is selfish or unselfish. And it is because that he is aware of this instinctively that he is continually attempting to conceal the undesirable phases of his own nature. If he did not recognize them and did not know they were undesirable, he would not hide them from his fellow men. And the moment an individual hides an action, he is telling you that he knows that it is wrong. Therefore, when we do anything, 
uh, of a quality which we would not wish others to know. I don't mean in the terms of normal privacy, but I mean in the terms of action for which we would feel shame or remorse. Then we are performing an action that is not right. And if we are performing this action, we are setting up a chain reaction in nature. Paracelsus also went on to say that there are in this world, in this visible world in which we live, creatures around us and in nature whose constitution is different from what it appears to be. There are forms of life that are manifesting here which do not have their roots in the common life. He declared that there are human beings in the world apparently, whose origin is different from that of some other person. That in this world of things that all appear to be the same, there is more than one cause, more than one form of life, more than one type of being existing. Paracelsus points out that there are beings with us and around us who, like the elementals, are not of the flesh of Adam. And that for that reason, there are persons by whom, by whose origin a unique or peculiar destiny is inevitable. These persons may not know this themselves. But Paracelsus pointed out that in legends, that heroes or heroic beings are frequently born of the union of human and superhuman parents, that nearly always in the great world teachers and saviors and sages, there is a hint of a miraculous origin between human and non-human factors uniting to produce such persons, as in the simple case of Merlin the magician, who is said to have been the son of a mortal woman and a salamander. What the facts behind this story is, we do not say again. But Paracelsus was convinced through his medical therapy and research that there was more than one kind of human being and that the plants that grow by the side of the road, some of those plants belong to this earth and some do not. But the study of these things would be of the greatest importance because perhaps of their remedial agents. <clears throat> he pointed out, for example, that we recognize uh, the importance of, the, of various planets in the sense of the lives upon them and their possible interference or participation in our affairs. This is coming again with the thinking that is now in our public mind, are other planets inhabited? Are there other worlds? Are there other dimensions from which flying saucers might come? We have all these problems that are worrying us a little at the moment. Paracelsus did the first worrying recorded to modern man on these subjects. He was concerned with them constantly, for he was convinced out of his own wanderings and his practice that this is not the simple world that we think it is. But there are many elements and factors in it uh, which are incomprehensible to us that we have no way of estimating. And that a great many so-called acausal factors are traceable to the invisible world around us. But this invisible world is full of life, full of light, full of beings. And that humans may to some degree respond to these beings and that the legends that we have relating uh, to contacts between mortals and immortals may have bearing upon dimensions which will open to us in the future. When these dimensions open to us, they will not appear to be supernatural in any way. There is nothing uh, in the universe of Paracelsus, with all his thinking, uh, that he would have acknowledged for a moment to be supernatural. He declared there could not be anything supernatural because nature is in itself a law. But that there are a great many things which man in his ignorance 
considers miraculous or regards as supernatural because he has no available explanation for them, but that all unknown or concealed things as they move into our understanding become natural, become acceptable, and become practically matter-of-fact in every day. But until we recognize them, until we know them, they seem miraculous and impossible. Now, there are several uh, points of practical bearing uh, to be derived from the Paracelsian concept of the nature spirit, which perhaps we should also consider. Man's present problem in life, his present physical problem, deals very gravely with biochemic factors. The problem of man's balancing the various energy fields with which he is at present concerned, becoming more vital all the time. Each year as it goes by, finds medicine in its traditional form of therapy less and less suitable to the needs of the individual. The therapy which was sufficient for our ancestors, mostly bleeding, poulticing, and purging, is no longer suitable to us. The tremendous leaning upon chemical medicine, which has increased so powerfully with the rise of the great pharmaceutical houses, is also gradually moving away from us. Uh, we have declared rather emphatically and have proven to some degree that we have extended physio physical therapies in the form of materia medica uh, into almost every field and we have cures for almost everything which is conceivable to us. One or two desperate problems remain unsolved but for the most part, our pharmacopoeia uh, can cope with almost anything. Yet we are not well. We are perhaps less well than ever before in history. And by degrees, our entire series of system of therapy is moving from a physical therapy to a borderline approach between the visible and the invisible parts of man. We're beginning to recognize, for example, that disease, for the most part, arises within man. We know and have known for a long time that the human being is a, a walking bacterial laboratory, that almost every ailment conceivable to man is already in him at all, the time, at all times, but that while the balance of his health is maintained, these Negative circumstances do not accomplish any evil or ill. Man's sickness arises when he falls out of balance, when the harmonic relations between the energy centers are destroyed or disrupted. The moment there is unbalance, there is death. And this local death, if it is not handled quickly, spreads and becomes a general disease for that individual. Thus, our entire theory of therapy today is to keep the human mechanism in the equilibrium, to maintain the constant motion of its energies, and to prevent the obstruction of these energies, recognizing in malnutrition and in physical ailments, particularly physical injury, common causes of obstruction. Recognizing always that disease and obstruction move together. The problem is to keep man's system constantly open, keeping his energy fields free to move or send their supply of light without inhibition or limitation to any part of the body where this energy may be necessary. And it is necessary, of course, in one of its forms, or more than one, in all parts of the body. Thus we have the problem of what constitutes uh, the greatest 
danger that can possibly confront man? The answer is debility. The moment debility is observed, the individual is open to everything. The ability will reduce his resistance to infection. It will reduce his resistance to negation. It makes it easier for him to complain, find fault, be discouraged, be bitter, antagonistic. Depletion destroys basic optimism because it destroys man's internal sense of security. The moment his sense of security is destroyed, he goes into a panic. The degree of the destruction measuring, of course, the degree of the panic. Thus, debility is the great enemy. A man lives in a universe of life. Paracelsus describes this as a tremendous field in which man lives in life as the fish lives in the sea. It would be just as impossible to say that life fails man as it would to say that the, that the sea fails the fish. It, is, it cannot be that man by any circumstance can be deprived of life by life any more than religiously, we may say, and Paracelsus held the idea that any man could so hasten in any direction or so rapidly that he could in any conceivable or inconceivable time be nearer to or further away from God. That which is eternal, ever-present, without limitation or boundary, is accessible to all things at all times. Thus, life, per se, is available to man at all times. Life can never be separated from man. Man must separate himself from life. Life in itself is not a separable agent. It is a complete diffusion. It cannot withdraw any area of itself and leave a vacuum. It is therefore possible only that man, as Paracelsus points out, is deprived of life because he destroys the areas or fields within himself by means of which life is distributed through the structure which he calls his body. The human being is equipped with a kind of aerial, similar to that of a radio or television. This aerial gathers this energy, or receives it, and distributes it through the system. It is only after this energy reaches the aerial and begins its distribution that anything can happen to it. And the thing that can happen to it is that it can be blocked. It can be blocked superphysically or physically. It can be blocked mentally, emotionally, or materially. But unless it is blocked, it cannot fail. And in the human being, it is usually not totally blocked. But if any major element of it is blocked, you will have a major imbalance loss of vitality, loss of function, or you will have the cause of the gradual rising of a particular ailment within what would otherwise, otherwise be regarded as a healthy body. The fair self tells us that energy moving in upon man is blocked in three levels. It is blocked mentally, it cannot be blocked spiritually because spirit cannot move against itself. It can be blocked only mentally, emotionally, or physically. It is mentally blocked if, for example, the individual, by his attitude, closes his mental field by mental tension, which locks the field. It is emotionally blocked by emotional tension, which locks the field. 
It is physically blocked by physical tension, which locks that field. Therefore, tension, mental, emotional, and physical, must precede the failure of bodily function. Mental tension, emotional tension, or physical tension are all of them the results of malfunction. Regardless of what we want to believe, or what we would like to affirm, or how we would like to protect our attitude, all tension is essentially bad. There is no such a thing as righteous indignation. There is no such a thing as a godly temper. There is no such a thing as a justifiable hate. We may have justifiable cause for certain reservations. We may feel that certain situations, because of what they are, cannot receive our approval we may voluntarily decline to become involved in something we do not believe is right. Decision is permitted under any and all conditions, but tension is never permissible under any condition by nature. Therefore, tension, wherever it accompanies decision, precedes it or follows it, will destroy function. If the mental energy field is blocked by mental tension, by any one of the negative mental attitudes that we know, the flow of mental energy into the structure is restricted, resulting in mental fatigue, first evident in poor judgment, and the inability of the individual to think clearly. Where a mind becomes confused, it is because tension has blocked its energy. Where the mind becomes tired, it is seldom because of thinking. We're not that good at it. What it generally means is that we are fatigued by confusion, and confusion is tension. In the emotional field, it is the same. Confusion is tension. Hate, grief. Jealousy, envy, these emotional pressures create tension and lock the emotional agent. Wherever we lock the mental agent, according to Paracelsus, we lock the air content of the body. In other words, uh, every emotional, every mental attitude affects respiration. We know this is more or less provable. But Paracelsus goes further with it. He points out that the whole process of respiration, as we know it, is far more complicated than we see. It's not merely opening your mouth and swallowing air. It is not merely gasping for breath. Mental tension interrupts or disturbs the flow of the air current and the energies which they carry. And this air factor is finally localized in every single cell of the body. Therefore, the pollution of the mental agent results in symbolic reaction downward into matter in the pollution of the air field. So every time we have negative thinking or destructive thinking, we are setting up a private smog problem which is going to pollute every bit of the respirational process of that body, loading it with toxins. The emotional element affects the fire content, and to some degree also the fluid content, but primarily the fire content. And wherever the emotional factor is unbalanced, we have too much or too little of the igneous principle in the body, resulting in your flushing, resulting in chills, resulting in all the upsets in the 
actual caloric balance of the chemical structure of the body. Interference or tension on a physical level disrupts the intake of chemical ether, which is the actual medium by which all nutrition is conveyed from the source of food to the functioning structure of body chemistry. Therefore, a destructive or unbalanced pressure striking into the physical organization disturbs man's ability to transform nutrition into available energy. So the moment tension arises in any of these three fields, we have disturbance. Nature has created a defense against disturbance. And this defense operates up to a certain point. But if the disturbance is too prolonged and is allowed to increase until the disturbance center, like a storm center, is greater than the ability of the body to compensate for, or greater than the ability of normal rhythm to defend itself against, then the inroads upon the constitution begin and the individual passes into a state of depletion. Whenever these things happen, we have, according to Paracelsus, the therapeutic introduction of elementals. Because the elementals, in part of their function, have to do with the regulation of the elements in the body. The Paracelsus points out that there are actually elementals functioning within the magnetic field of man that it is perfectly proper that they should be there, inasmuch as they are the custodians of energy. They must take care of the remedial procedures. Paracelsus has pointed out that the elemental, elementals are largely the protectors of elements, and that wherever remedial procedure goes on in nature, wherever a wall that is torn down is apparently rebuilt by nature. All rebuilding is under the control of elementals. Therefore, without the assistance of these people, nothing can be restored that has once been destroyed in the structure. Just as man tearing down a wall must either rebuild it or it remains there. So when in biochemistry any elemental field is torn down or damaged, it is notable that we have what is called a recuperative procedure in nature. Nature fighting to build back. Nature isolating an infection. Nature capsulating a tumor. Nature moving in to cause a bone to knit. <coughs> If we could see these procedures in action, if we could slow down films or do something to watch these remedial processes as we can now watch the opening of a flower, for example, we would observe that nature moves in on this situation, not merely as a blind force, but as a highly intellectual and selective force, doing exactly the things necessary we cannot assume, or at least Paracelsus did not dare to assume, and I think we would almost agree with him, that the one sovereign intellect of the universe could personally supervise the restoration of every cell in the composite body of all the kingdoms existing in nature. That these remedial processes must therefore be under sub-leadership or government just as no one man could take care of all the problems of humanity and is lucky if he can take care of his own. We also recognize that in the knitting of a bone, the human intelligence itself is not the source of the remedy. Man does not know any more about the knitting of a bone, actually, or how to cause it, than almost any other mystery of life.
any more than he would know exactly how to keep his own heart beating. He can tell how to stop it, but he does not know how to start it or keep it beating. In Parasocian uh, theory, therefore, everywhere in nature where intelligent processes are going on, they are made possible through elemental beings existing within these substances. Beings that have the same peculiar shrewdness or the same intuitive skill that the bee has in the creation of its world. For according to Perisosis, the mystery of the ant and the bee and the beaver, the mystery of the squirrel storing up provisions, all of these mysteries go back to the nature spirits, just as the Greeks believed that the nature spirits were the guardians of the lesser kingdoms of life. Paracelsus said, yes, that is probably true. But also, by the same token, because all kingdoms of life are also in man, man has parts of his nature which are animal, parts that are vegetable, parts that are mineral. So man likewise, in his recuperative procedures in medicine, functions and works through the cooperation of intelligent beings that have the natural skill to repair uh, disaster. Even the physician today will tell you that he can set a bone, but he cannot make it knit. And the knitting of the bone may be a very difficult procedure. He can sterilize the abrasion or, the, uh, or clean out any poison that may be there. He can set it properly. He can examine it periodically. He can tell the possessor of the broken member certain things to do which normally will increase the probability of knitting and make available more calcium and things of that nature but he cannot make the bone knit. The human being who owns the bone cannot make it knit himself, but he can stop it from knitting. He can stop it from knitting by worry alone. He can stop it by fear. He can stop it by any emotion that reduces the availability of natural current. A Paracelsus would say he can stop it by cutting off the elemental energy by which the elemental being is able to create its own elaborate lace-like mingling of minute strands and threads by which that bone gradually knits together. <clears throat> the process of knitting a bone, the bone knitting is more marvelous and more wonderful than probably the most delicate experiment that man can make. <clears throat> And yet, everywhere, it reveals intelligence. Paracelsus did not believe that the bone itself was intelligent. But he believed that every living force or energy available to man and necessary to man's function was intelligent. And in the University of Paris, uh, some years ago, a paper was read to prove or justify the idea that electricity existed in two forms, one of which was intelligence. And that therefore, you could reason with electricity. Certain phases of it are responsive uh, to intellectual selectivity. Energy is the same way. And Paracelsus believed that energy operated in the production of its miracles simply because it was a field of life and of living things and of intelligent beings. And that these intelligent beings were the architects and administrators of energy. He therefore created within his elemental kingdoms, created races and numerous sub-races. He pointed, as we have said, to the fact that there were animals, plants, human beings, or their equivalents in these elements and that these animals and plants in the elements had also their polarities in man. For there are structures in the human body dependent entirely upon fire. Others dependent entirely upon water. 
Others dependent upon a chemistry of fire and water. Each of these parts of man is nourished by its own energy counterpart in space. A man can sustain no organ, no function, and no power that he does not sustain through his participation in a total availability. Now, modern man thinks of this avail availability as one substance differentiated in man. Paracelsus said no, that it is not merely one substance. It is essentially one principle, but it has already been highly differentiated before it reaches man. Therefore, man is himself an image of its differentiation. It does not break up in man. It is because it has already broken up that it can produce man. For man already represents an orderly division of energy and thousands of different structures, millions perhaps, have to exist in the energy field before the composite body we call man could have been created or devised. Man, if he were merely a funnel for the distribution of solar energy or stellar energy or cosmic energy, he would need, need to be no more than a riverbank through which these things could flow. But he is not. He is an infinite diversity which can only exist because Energy has already been diversified before it reaches him. Therefore, it sustains not only him and his diversity, but an infinite number of other forms of diversity. Each of these diversified levels is intelligent. And being, intel being intelligent and being generative produces within itself beings of its own kind that become its agents. And these beings administer it just as we regard the hierarchs of, of ancient times as administering the solar power through the solar system. Thus Paracelsus tells us that it is very good for us to live in a perpetual respect for invisible life to know that it exists, uh, to attempt to understand it, to arbitrate with it, to rationalize with it. And I think perhaps the, one of the best examples of that is the story I tell about Luther Burbank, who was able, as he told me, to accomplish certain things with plans because he had sense enough to sit down and talk to them. Others had the same skill, but they did not get the results. Burbank said, these people have forgotten that when you deal with a potato, you are not dealing with a humble spud. You are dealing with a living thing, with a soul. And until you find that out, the true kinship between man and the potato will not be established. A potato is a highly respectable form of life. And small plants that we hardly recognize have three sense perceptions for each of ours. The only reason we do not think they are conscious is because they talk. They do not talk. On the other hand, we talk all the time, and that does not prove that we are conscious. <laughs> the world, then, to Paracelsus, was this tremendous sphere of life, with countless organizations moving with man growing up in it as a composite dependent upon all phases of it for the maintenance and equilibrium of his existence. And man, most of all, has got to sign a treaty of peace with life. He's got to form strong treaties. He's got to create his own league of nations binding all of the elements of life that are necessary to him into a camaraderie of purposes, and not into a highly speculative, highly combative, highly competitive series of relationships. Man can persuade life to do many things, said old Paracelsus, but can force life to do nothing. 
Therefore, the physician is the persuader, the one who seeks to arbitrate, who seeks to understand, and who seeks to see that all the elements involved in the correction of the physical difficulty have been given due consideration, honorable understanding, and helpful cooperation. In these ways, not only do we realize help to be a, an organization of intelligence, but we realize that sickness is actually a sickness of these intelligent relationships. That sickness is not natural. That sickness is not actually a, an immortal principle. That sickness is that which breaks rules or is the result of the disobedience in other words, sickness like evil is, say, so to say, the result of man falling away from nature. The fall of man being the fall into conceit, into departure from the reasonable, the rational, and the true. One of the ways to correct this is to suddenly realize that we live in a cooperative universal commonwealth. That the food we eat, the air we breathe, the clothing we wear, taken from the plant or the animal, that all these things are a part of a great pageantry of life, that we are in debt to everything that makes us live, and that we meet that debt by the constructive use of the powers and faculties that we possess for the improvement of total life. Millions of lives are sacrificed every day that we may live. And if we wish to be healthy, we must have a conviction in ourselves that these who have died have not died in vain. Man lives upon life. Therefore, he owes the debt to life. This debt is to live well and to advance life in every way that he can. And man's peculiar power is to preside over this pattern of elements to bring it into harmony and through harmonious adjustments to advance the total growth of life. Man is the gardener in the great field of vitality and it is his privilege to keep the garden well. And if he keeps the garden, the wonderful things that grow in the garden will keep him. If he neglects the garden, these things change into weeds and his own nutrition is lost. But instead of man being a creature fighting space of the unknown forever to survive, man is actually a living thing, living in a world of living things. A world which in its natural and proper order is his friend. These living things, his co-workers, their happiness, their normalcy depending to a degree upon his and his upon them. And by gradually assuming this position, Paracelsus believed that the individual developed a philosophy of health that was adequate and suitable for him. And we will take up the next phase of Paracelsus' philosophy next week. <laughs>